Kia ora, Katie. Kia ora. How are we doing, Carla? I'm really well, thank you. Well, much better than I was a few weeks ago, and I think that's probably uh, much the same for you based on the, the little combo that we've just had. So it's so really um, great to have you joining me for this chit chat this afternoon, where we're going to go into a little bit of um, uncharted territory because we haven't really had a chit chat before where we've been focusing on um, secondary schooling intervention or even secondary schooling teaching. So thank you. Thank you so much for giving up some of your time and joining me. I know you've got a wealth of knowledge and experience that you are just busting at the seams to share with, um, with all of our colleagues across New Zealand. So thanks so much, Katie, for giving up your time um, to spend with us this afternoon. You're absolutely welcome. Looking forward to giving the gift of our journey in structured literacy and implementing that at Wapiti High School. Thank you. So I'd just like to kick off, Katie, by sharing a little bit about you, if that's okay. So um, for those of you who haven't had the privilege of um, meeting or working with Katie Tompkins from Wakatipu High School in Queenstown, Katie is an experienced educator who has spent 25 years working in classrooms and also educational leadership in both New Zealand and overseas. Currently, Katie is the Head of Learning Support and the Literacy Leader at Wakatipu High School in Queenstown, where she teaches intervention. In addition to experience in teacher education, Katie has also participated in a wide range of educational opportunities that have been outside the scope of, um, scope of experience of many other educators. These include the appointment as head teacher of St Mary's Hospital Unit in London and being one of nine teachers selected nationally to travel to Ukraine where she attended a research-based professional development program studying practical examples and strategies for improving social inclusion in inner city areas. My goodness, that sounds incredibly interesting. And Katie. A self-directed learner at the chalk face, Katie has moved beyond the research and taken the science of reading into the reality of a classroom, classroom. and it works. And that's what we're going to hear about this afternoon um, from Katie. So espoused theories in action versus theory in use. Secondary classes with multiple students who struggle to, to read let alone write. So um, Katie, let's begin our chit chat this afternoon by hearing a little bit from you about what instigated your move into implementing a structured literacy approach. Absolutely. Um, I'll definitely give you the backstory. Um, so my thinking, re how the brain learns to read and how to help struggling readers actually, I probably started way back in um, 2015 when I won an RTLB position based in Queenstown and um, in the Wakatibi Basin and previous to this I had already been um, at Wakatibi High School I've since returned as a Dean in Social Sciences I certainly wasn't an English teacher I didn't have any linguistics training so um, it was definitely a new position. So I, as is the RTL B model, um, it's basically the idea is to build capacity with the teacher. You don't work so much hands-on one-on-one with the students. And um, I was allocated a number of students um, who struggled to learn to read. Some of those had a formal diagnosis of dyslexia, but many did not. And I ab knew absolutely, I had no idea how to help the teacher um, and support the, the, these children with these sorts of issues. I was studying through Massey University at the time and I was hoping that this would point me in the right direction because I was desperate to figure out how I can help these, um, these kids and these teachers. And all the, it really only just scratched the surface. Um, it's certain, I certainly didn't come across the science of reading. I didn't come across structured literacy. And so what I did, um, I started to read an awful lot. I asked a lot of questions of my colleagues. I probably drove them nuts, but it actually raised more questions mm -hmm. than it answered. And to, and to quote you, Carla, I, would, I, I, I considered myself uh, consciously unskilled. I knew I didn't have the skill set to help out and I wanted to do a good mm. job. Um, 
I'd seen reading recovery happening in the primary schools and I just didn't feel hand over heart that the strategies um, being taught were actually, you know, guessing words, um, encouraging kids to read through. And I watched them sort of as time went on and I just didn't see any um, great improvement in their reading. Anyway, um, for a few reasons, a position um, back at Wakatibi High School, I actually love this school, came up and I, with a, it had a quite a significant literacy component and I felt um, that I could make a much bigger difference if I could work in one school and I could actually be more hands-on with the students, so I went back. Our journey, um, Wakatibi High School's journey into structured literacy. I went back in 2017, it, um, so it was two years later, and it, start, it was began in 2019 when we had eight of our Wakatibu staff members, leaders in their own right. We had um, SLT, some heads of learning, and we um, uh, instigated professional learning with yourself um, at that time. We met for a year, over a year, termly. Um, there were homework tasks in between. And of course, myself and um, you, we, we connected quite a bit to sort of get things where we want them to go and, um, and, and next steps, et cetera. And mm. this was in response to a recognition that I'd been back in the school for two years and teaching an intervention and literacy support classes as they were known then, and we now call them English Enhancement. Um, remove the stigma and putting in other interventions in place for kids that needed them that there was a growing number of students who hadn't mastered the word recognition or the the, the foundation skills that we badly needed them to have um, and we expected them to have um, going um, to be able to access text at the secondary level where words become or vocabulary becomes complete um, a lot more sophisticated. We move on from those sort of Anglo-Saxon words to a degree into your Latin and Greek origin words. And the, the structure changes in terms of the text from um, into more of an expository um, domain. So more um, informational based and less sort of storytelling. And I, was, uh, I think it was a quote that you put out there. We need kids at secondary level, and, um, and I'll get to that in a minute, who actually can read for meaning. And, and, and if they can't lift those words mm. off the page, those words that carry that meaning, um, then we have a big problem. Mm. And there, yeah. there, is, there is an expectation at high school and an assumption that, that, that students come to us already having mastered those that bottom rope, word recognition rope and Hollis Scalbra's rope, um, that they've already got those skills and that we can focus on the language comprehension strands. Sadly, and increasingly so, um, and I say it is, it's a bit of tragedy, that isn't the case. Anyway, before getting you on board, Carla, bit of a quandary, what do I do? Um, I didn't know what to do. Do we go back? I knew that um, probably they didn't have those skills or has that ship sailed? And um, yeah, where do we go from here? And if, you work, work, if you're listening and you work in a secondary sector, it's probably crossed your minds. And even as you're working through, it, it continues to cross your mind because it is, it is hard yakka. But um, and another question is, how do I build what's going on in intervention to across the curriculum? Because we need to get some consistency happening there. But where I got to with my thinking mm. was, oh my goodness, absolutely we do. We've got a moral obligation. We have a responsibility to, to develop the literate brains of all our learners, including our struggling readers, and jumping to accommodation isn't acceptable. Um, if you read all those stories about, I've learned to read when I'm 64 and it's changed my life, et cetera, et cetera. We just have to, um, <laughs> we have to, we have to do this. Um, and, and, and we have mm -hmm. a, a totally. duty of care to do so. So we engaged the support of you, yeah. Kate, and I'm forever thankful. Um, and it was an absolute game changer. You introduced um, me, to the science of reading, um, to a structured literacy approach, which aligns with that. And yeah, so basically our, and, um, that's what instigated us into structured literacy, mm. science of reading. And also once I'd heard enough and started to read, I knew that this was the direction that we needed to go, that this was actually mm. something that was gonna work for our kids. And um, I haven't looked back. So that's what, that, that was the instigation. Yeah. 
Can we, um, there's a couple of really key points that I'd like to pick up on there that I think when I recall back to that time when we were working together that um, might be relevant for other people, um, Katie. So I'm just going to recap on a couple of the key points that you made first. Fundamentally, what you shared with us from the outset was that you came to the realisation that your knowledge was um, somewhat limited. You knew that potentially, it's like you had this inkling that you needed to know more. You went on to do further study, but that study didn't really give you um, necessarily the answers that were going to help you to ultimately change your practice at the chalk face and um, lead to increasing um, student outcomes. You talked about knowing that you were consciously unskilled. And I, I wanna thank you for adding that in there because what we do often share with people is that we want to build a nation or, or a, a globe of um, consciously skilled teachers. But for us to become consciously skilled, we need to first sit in that place of being consciously unskilled. And where we don't want to be is unconsciously unskilled because that's that real danger zone of when we don't know what we're doing right or we're doing wrong. Um, when we think back to, um, I can vividly remember the day that we all sat around the meeting room at Wakatapu High School and all the heads of department came in and we were sitting around and we had some pretty robust dialogue, I'm going to um, say, around you know, the role of explicitly teaching at word level and the importance mm -hmm. of teaching vocabulary and um, and some of the key things that I remember in those pieces of work that we did that have, you know, gone on to sort of infiltrate and spread through um, to making a bigger difference carrying on through the years. I remember some really basic things like, um, you know, we taught those heads of departments about syllable types and we taught mm. them about syllable division. Mm. And we, we asked them um, in one instance to bring um, one of their subject assignments along to the meeting. And then we asked them to, what's it called um, where you, I'm going to call it a vocab list, but that's not the correct term. You have um, a specific term at Wakatipu High School than like focus words or um, oh, I can't remember what the terminology um, is, but uh, basically domain. Um, yeah, yeah. Domain. Okay, so maybe maybe domain specific mm. um, words because I remember that um, the um, teacher who shared the um, unit on volcanoes, and we yeah. were looking at specific terminology, but. Um, what I do remember is that those um, heads of department were um, put into a situation where they really delved into what is the literacy component of this assignment or this piece of work that these students are going to be doing in their classrooms and what might what skill and knowledge might I need as a teacher to ensure that I'm not just teaching the content um, for the content's sake that actually I'm ensuring students can access the content through being able to like you said earlier lift the words off the page Absolutely. and so I remember we had we had them take those those I'm going to call them vocab lists but we had mm. them take those vocab lists and split them into syllable types mm. and then um, practice all that work themselves and um, so I think that that early piece of work that was instigated mm. around how they lay out their assignments to make them manageable for your students that were in learning intervention, how they actually learn about syllable types and syllable division and present assignments to ensure students not only understand the terminology in the assignments, but are taught how to read through the words um, is really, really important as well. And I'd like to think that that went on to um, increase the amount of, of explicit teaching and purposeful teaching for all learners in both that word recognition piece of the rope and that language comprehension piece relevant to that subject um, area. So yeah, I just wanted to add that little bit in because I think sometimes people ask us specific questions like, well, what actually can we do? You know, what can I be mm -hmm. doing in my geography lessons or my mm -hmm. science lessons? So um, much. And so much we can do. Yeah. So do you think if we said for people who were listening, Katie, like number one might be actually in the first instance, get really clear on the vocab and the unit of work that you're working on. Make 100%. sure your students. 
make sure they make sure you know as the teacher how they would decode that vocab uh -huh. what syllable types the syllable uh -huh. division do they know and the, the and word then, meanings and then move that in um beyond that into your morphology like to break words apart in, term, in terms of your root words and your your affixes um mm. and i think um i'm sort of um diverting a little bit here too but along with that your cycle you know awareness to to evidence-based action, based action mm. um to to you cannot jump straight from your problem to your action and it mm. takes a lot of time um as you can imagine and if you're in a school it's a paradigm shift for a lot of staff um to grow that knowledge because the why behind the process that you're doing is so crucial to the buy-in um from your staff and, and that's what mm. creates the momentum. And particularly, we're in a growing school, um, forever changing. And this year we had 26 new staff in. So it's not a one hit wonder. It's something that you've got to wow. constantly revisit. And, I'll, and okay. I can talk more about that later. But um, yeah, mm. it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's ever going. And um, you hit, yeah, it, 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 that, one, that won't go away. Mm, totally. And so when we think about um, the steps that you took to ensure foundation skills were included both in intervention mm. and across the curriculum, you were very, very, very clear to me in your kind of brief um, once we started to begin working together. You, you knew from the outset of the importance of that alignment between what was happening with you supporting an intervention and actually the teaching and learning that was going on in the classroom. You were very, very clear on that right from the get-go. And, um, and that was great because it led to those meetings where we had all of those heads of department around the table um, and working through building their knowledge as you led through this and and built your system of implementation at Wakatipu. Could you just tell us a little bit more about, you know, what else were you thinking when you were starting out and ensuring that foundation skills um, were going to be taught? Well, I guess I was first thinking um, I, I, um, I would prefer, we would all prefer that we had more kids coming to us that um, had those decoding skills, that we're proficient in phonological awareness and phoneme awareness, mm. um, recognising, manipulating those sound parts of words. But it is what it is. Um, just as an aside, I'm pretty excited yeah. what's happening in a basin at the moment. And thanks <laughs> to you, Carla. Um, we've got eight feet of primary schools. Um, we're the only secondary school. So we're quite lucky in that respect. So mm, very unique. Public, yeah. Um, we have got um, the science of reading, structured literacy hitting those classrooms. Many of those classrooms and those schools are working really hard. Mm. And I, my belief is, um, I, this is a bit of a pivot, but that if that was happening consistently in the basin and actually I'm going to broaden that out to New Zealand, we wouldn't be seeing the numbers that we are. So I just want mm. to put that in there. But anyway, so um, uh, the, one of the first things we did with you Carla, was consider our model um, in terms of um, setting up a literacy model um, of support for Wakatibi High School with, for a pathway for kids that presented with literacy learning needs. Um, and that was to basically support and inform parents and key stakeholders what that pathway looked like for the kids as they transitioned to high school and to be able to put in those necessary um, interventions and remediations. And that model is evolving and it is developing. It, we start with gathering our, the, the process is pretty, it's pretty tight now. We start with gathering the information from the feeder primary schools. We meet annually to refine that. Um, this is for kids initially that need additional support in any which way. Um, we This all happens before they even come. We have some chem testing involved there, which is sort of your verbal reasoning, whatever. Um, we, we, we spread that out to our staff and all that information is accessible to them via their roles. Students um, are tiered from sort of low needs to high needs. And we, when people go into their roles at the high school, they can see that learning conditions, dyslexia, I'm gonna talk literacy, but it's actually wider than that. They mm -hmm. can see sort of key strategies they can put them right there and then um, and um, anything else if they've got set provisions, et cetera. So they've got that information ready to go. Students with literacy learning needs that are identified um, before they even arrive, 
they all start now in the foundation English classes and um, for the first semester before coming in intervention and there's really good reasons why that's the case because when I first set out um, we were kids were coming into intervention that um, some of them didn't need to be there because the information mm. was not as robust as it needed it to be and some of them missed out so we get in there now and we do further diagnostics we do the fluency testing um, we do spelling concept testing and we make sure the kids that should be getting um, that intervention are the right ones for it so um, that's a really important part of our process so we analyze that report we get those results we decide on our resourcing where all our kids are going to go what interventions are going to happen for those kids we meet with the parents really big part of the jigsaw discuss why their kids are doing what they're doing what the purpose of that is how they can support at home and then we um, monitor them get them in and get them going but we're at a stage now where um, that model um, because of our growing numbers of kids without these foundation skills it, it, it's actually a stage where we need to evolve that um, and mm. I've just recently presented to the heads of the department instead of just having a set curriculum in our junior English classes I said we need to create a curriculum that is actually tailored to the kids sat in those seats um, so we're looking on that mm. now because we've got the diagnostic tools to do that other steps, um, obviously in a big school to gain any sort of momentum and also a school that is increasing in staff, there's a huge amount of upskilling that has to happen in terms of even what are foundation skills, what are some of the evidence actions that we can put into place there, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I really work to that um, awareness to action um, model mm. that you often refer to, be aware of the problems, you know, um, grow your knowledge and your understanding, create the empathy and then put in the right evidence-based actions, really important. My steps, I um, have got a big job here of building capacity in the school. So my knowledge and understanding has to be pretty pretty out there and I can't begin to, to actually, you would know. Um, the hours and hours I have spent reading books, um, watching webinars and YouTube clips, um, yeah, David Kilpatrick's book, um, Quick for Reading Success, Lenara Aries, taking recognition skills and shifting those to self-teaching shared with that shared mm. self-teaching hypothesis, which has actually been pretty cool learning because um, it can be a little bit daunting for any educator, but particularly at secondary level where um, we need these kids to actually take up what we're teaching them and um, actually start to do that themselves so and um, I love the idea that once these mm. kids have really sound phonological foundation or author, orthographic foundation they can actually recode what they don't know um, into mm. um, into so that's that's really been an awesome piece of learning Anita Archer's um, stuff around explicit teaching because it's so important for structured literacy and if actually all teaching generally um, has been absolutely. absolutely awesome. Lynn Stone, oh my gosh, the list goes on and on and on. Louisa Moat. <laughs> um, but I can honestly say um, your platform has been really, really helpful. And I'm, I'm, here, I'm where I'm at because I haven't had to go, okay, so where is all this good research? Um, because you've already sourced it. I just then mm -hmm. have to take it up and and read it, read it again, figure out what I don't know and go on from there. So that's been really transformative. Other steps um, that we've taken to um, growing knowledge and consistency across the curriculum. I now, different than what it has been um, traditionally in the past, work really, really closely with the English department mm -hmm. to build their knowledge and understanding. Awesome. I've given presentations to the department around read the science of reading, how this is translated into a structured literacy approach, how this differs from that sort of whole word language, language approach, because we still have some people who are sort of thinking along those lines. We've mm -hmm. looked at the models, the simple view of reading. We've looked at um, Skowers Reading Rope. We've looked at your building blocks to a reading success. And we've used those as a bit of a stock take as to where do our kids sit currently and are we actually teaching mm -hmm. those components and how can they how can they actually work with us redeveloping our curriculums, I guess. We've looked at how the brain learns to read and the parts of the brain that need to be activated to store those letters those letter strings that get unitized and words in our long-term memory. And that's been quite, they've loved it. They love all that brain stuff. Mm. 
it's really interesting, but more so the huge implications for our teaching methods for um, helping support our unskilled readers across the curriculum. So when they, um, in terms of building their vocabulary, when they are struggling with their spelling and how that's symptomatic of a lot of other things, when they get stuck, stuck on words, we've reached an understanding, you look, sequence of letters, translating those into your sounds or your, um, your phonemes, blending them together. Obviously your syllable division comes in there as well. And the number of exposures that some of our kids need, and oh my goodness, it's a lot to actually get those, mm -hmm. um, those words and those word parts implanted in that long-term memory. Other steps, yeah. oh my gosh, it goes on and on. We've got professional learning groups that I'm about to lead. We'll, um, this is with other staff members where we go through that process of um, again, 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 and again, um, how the brain um, sets up that reading network. We're looking at the sorts of reading problems that they're currently seeing. We're looking at the, re you know, um, Tanma and Goff stuff, um, moving into um, evidence-based actions, because it's really important too that these kids, these strugglers aren't sort of seeing what's happening in intervention, and then they're going into these classrooms where they're using those strategies that are actually are not going to help them it's really mm. confusing for them mm. so that's huge. we're also going to look at exactly what you talked about before how we present the um, assignments in the junior school we've done it before but we've got a number of new staff and um, consider mm. that model that's inclusive for all all kids at Wakatipu High School and and in a way that they'll see the structure that they're going to see at NCA assist them with those executive sort of functioning issues um, and, and help them help those kids actually self-manage themselves away through those assignments and also the parents mm. them, anyone supporting them oh my god the list goes on but um it's it's <laughs> huge um in terms of building staff understanding one thing I will say though um it's really important in terms of buy-in that they don't see structured literacy as just for novice readers. It's actually a wonderful mechanism for, for getting into those higher level decoding skills. Mm, it is. Sophisticated vocabulary. So, and it's a huge selling point. So getting stuck in there. We, um, we are currently being aeroed and we have an aero evaluation <laughs> improvement plan set up and they've decided that the focus of that is literacy. The model is a bit different than it used Brilliant. to be. Um, yeah. And they've decided that because they've noticed something's going on here and um, mm. they want to look at sort of what are we doing to accelerate the kids in structured literacy? How can we transfer that to, um, for instance, a group of year 10 students who sort of languish at level four in terms of ESL results, don't really move? Mm. How can we take those elements and principles and make them work for kids who maybe don't have those problems, but they're certainly not moving in other ways mm. and also how do we build capacity as leaders for staff to put in evidence-based literacy yeah mm. um, actions within our that's classroom. exciting I can't um yeah. I'm really looking forward to reading that report when it comes out that's yeah. really exciting there's a, yeah there's a lot of money so, going on there so as you were talking Katie I was writing key things down and yes. just kind of numbering them off and I'd like to share them back for people who are thinking because a lot of people will be hopefully listening to this from their secondary setting and thinking okay well where might I start and I think the number one is you need a driver and maybe if you're listening to this it's that you're the driver in your school so you were the driver at Wakatipu High School and you did a lot of the legwork to get this initial shift across the line but we need a driver dedicated to a marathon race not a sprint race um, mm. and it's maybe it's actually multiple marathons um, you know over consecutive years because it does feel like a multiple marathon mm. it's a very very long journey to create the shift the number two that I wrote down that you talked about was there needs to be process written down like you that is something that I know we spent a lot of time um, working on reviewing the process that you did and didn't have and then refining that process and it's something that I know you have a real strength in coming back back and forth to the process of when students are transitioning to you um, from your contributing schools what is the screening process that takes place mm -hmm. what do you do with that data what does the data tell you what happens from there? How do you engage it with their Fano? All of those things, or how do you engage back to the contributing school? So, a process around transition 
from I'm going to say year eight to year nine, or for some it will be for year from year six yeah. to year seven, if that's where their secondary schooling journey starts, is a really, really, um, I think, really beneficial place to start because just like we say with our babies and new entrants, um, the younger we get these kids, the earlier. So if, if people are starting out, that might be somewhere they start out. And um, the number three was you talked extensively about professional learning and development. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really great to hear your extensive knowledge and all the things that you that you um, that you can quote. Um, you talked also about um, your number four, building close connections and um, relationships and shared understandings with your colleagues or heads of departments right across the different curriculum areas is something that you did very, very, very quickly to build quite, I'm going to say, rapid momentum across the school and rapid alignment between what you knew needed to happen in intervention and what you knew needed to happen in the classroom. And then you talked about your number five was you talked about ongoing monitoring and ongoing professional learning support. Like you said, you're just about to go into that new um, wave of professional learning groups and you know that this is a continuous cycle of improvement that it doesn't end um, so I just wanted to summarize that little bit because you said so many really good bits and hopefully people might be able to jot down and think about where are where they are along that step you've referred to the awareness to action cycle a few times I will make sure that that is posted that that image mm. is posted and Jeez. I think I've got a blog around that sitting somewhere um, or maybe even a video snippet that we can share because yes I know that when we came into this journey together that was a very very um, strong center for us to think about what's our current reality in this work um, that we were going to embark on together mm. so Katie um, let's jump into now what, you know, you've really stressed the importance of this is not just an intervention approach at Wakatipu. This is about building awareness and, and mm -hmm. pedagogy of quality evidence-based structured literacy practices right across the board in tier one. But what can you just tell us, what does this look like an in intervention at Wakatipu High School? Well, yeah, it definitely looks different than from when I first started. Um, when I first started, I was in my quandary, and we weren't. I wasn't. Um, I, I wasn't doing structured literacy. I didn't know what to do. So um, then we um, had the professional learning with you, and that's where the journey started. But since I started teaching an intervention, um, your platforms come on board. Um, and one of my famous yoga, great yoga teachers, he goes, when gratitude appears, negativity disappears. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> why I say that is having access, <laughs> having access to the professional learning modules, having access to the assessments, um, which guide me into my scope and sequence, which you also provide, having access to those instructional videos, um, having access to the resources has really um, basically sped up my learning um, because I haven't had to do that stuff myself. And so that's been, mm. um, that has been quite a game changer because I was, I felt a bit ad hoc when I first started because I, you know, I was, yeah, the bits weren't sort of all puzzled together so that's been a game changer I have a huge I have a, so much better understanding now of what we're trying to achieve here and how all learners create a, um, a reading network in their brains how they store those letters and letter strings and words in their long-term memory and the parts of the brain that need to be engaged and I'm actually able to share those with my students and for older students they love hearing about the brain and, and they also it's, it's, it's a great way for them to understand why we work through the process we do. So when I'm talking about, um, and they're using their spelling fingers, um, and I'm talking about the phonemes they're hearing or whatever, they're able to say, well, that's the Brockers area. And, but we haven't engaged this area. We haven't done that mm. one. So wow. um, that's actually really fantastic. And we were doing um, the other day, the old soft G and they were even saying because you know the old um, part of the brain the phonics chip is called the angular gyrus and it's actually spelt with a G 
So we were able to say, well, why is that? That's mm. because the why sits behind it. So you actually hear the ja. So we can build all that brain stuff in and that's actually been pretty cool. We started um, with fluency rate and spelling concept assessments, which guide us into the scope and sequence. I've since realized through a bit more of my learning, thanks um, again, that fluency is a little bit more complicated than I first envisaged. And I knew it involved expression and accuracy and whatever, but we've got access to the rubric now on the Learning Matters platform. Mm. So I could be a little bit more objective around our, our kids' fluency because some of them actually read really fast, but they actually yeah. aren't doing a very good job of it because they're, um, because they're not, um, the pace is actually too quick um, and they're sort of a bit monotone, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we can make better assessments that way. My, I guess uh, a, a huge bit of um, my learning has been around understanding the importance of phonological awareness, um, recognizing and manipulating those sound parts and, and, and spoken words, and perhaps more significantly though, phoneme awareness to this whole process. Um, and I have come to realize, because when we I first started teaching an intervention, we only looked at students' ability across alphabetical uh, alphabetic principle. And I've realized, mm. whoa, I actually have a quite a number of kids in my in my intervention class who can't detect those sounds and those spoken words, um, which is really concerning because if they can't match those spoken sounds with what they see, then it's um, not helping in terms of um, um, putting those words or those word parts into that um, into that little letter box. I love that name, letter box, because that's where yeah. it says letters, <laughs> where you post things away. Um, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so basically what I, I've built in now, I've um, I've hooked into Betty Sewell's word chain apps to support them with that awesome. phonetic awareness development. And I think, and the kids, they like that. Um, they're really good actually, I'd well recommend them. And um, we've done mm. the one, um, word chain for web and also um, David Kilpatrick's one minute activities, I've sort of built that into mm. my intervention as well. My understanding of explicit instruction, well, well that's really, I mean, we, it's a word we use a lot, but what does that actually mean? And Anita Archer's work has been really um, magnificent here. She talks about it being two areas, your design, what, what are you teaching, what's the important bits, how do you break that down in your delivery, how do you make that clear and unambiguous, etc. And so it's really helped the way that I set up my lessons, um, mm. which are pretty much, um, I always was pretty, pretty structured because I always knew that if you move things around a lot they're focusing on what's different as opposed to what you really want them to be learning but um yeah we always start with lots of review you know vowels short vowel sounds long vowel sounds the last concepts etc into your learning outcome definitely follow that sort of I do we do you actually it's more I do what is it we do we do we do an intervention you do and then you go back and you go forward mm -hmm. um pedagogy mm -hmm. And lots of practice, lots of guided practice, huge amount of checking for understanding. And I was watching something that you, I think it was, it must have been you, um, you likened it to a game of tennis and that's it, that's it, interaction. I serve it mm. out, you respond. Mm. And because and, yeah. and explicit mm. instruction, I mean, it's all very good and well to have that content, but um, how you deliver that is, is, is crucial to the whole process. My understanding of morphology wasn't even part of my teaching mm. when I started intervention. Also the important word parts um, that you've got to kind of learn first before the word sense that you're making through the morphology and your sentence structures has also grown um, dramatically. Um, we were doing what a concept, um, what's tie the spy, when I is, um, why is contained in words, it can make the long, vowel I sound um, and we you know wordless rely we then made that word into unreliable so we were able to break down look at that roots approach like what does rely mean mm. depending on for full trust mm. and confidence what does the un mean not what is the able capable so yeah not able to depend on for full trust or confidence so um and and so that's another way and that's grown so definitely weaving that in um, Another crucial thing is my um, knowledge around how to use decodable texts and um, mm. or control texts and actually authentic texts, which I have to do too mm. for some of my older readers using a structured literacy approach. And I have a really clear structure now to use there as well in terms of supporting them with their vocabulary, whatever. We follow that sort of, you know, within the book, identify three 
key words, follow that decode, mm. read, encode, spell, decode. Look at, um, you know, there's a whole structure there that you follow through. You ask your comprehension questions, you bring your spelling into your reading, you summarize the book. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with that too. You know, you can, I mean, what did I do yesterday? I said, righty, let's go through this book. And I want you to come up with three words that use three of the concepts we've taught. Tell me what the words are. Tell me what the concept is. Like there's so much that you can do there. And my knowledge there, because mm. at the beginning I was a wee bit, um, yeah, I wasn't quite sure how to how to make that all um, come into the big jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, so basically overall, I think I've just, um, yeah, I've just, my it's not gonna go, it's not gonna go away. I've realized every time I read something, whoa, yeah. I read something more, I'm gonna learn something more. Um, but I definitely feel a lot more confident in, 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 in getting in there and engaging my kids um, and making it work for mm. them. That's awesome. So you have a suite of assessment tools that you identify teaching and learning needs. You have a um, lesson structure outline. And what you were saying when you were talking, and I just wrote this down, I thought you have mentioned something about when we think about the the building blocks of reading success from phonological awareness at the bottom to comprehension at the top mm. you've actually talked about all of those elements Katie so you talked about phonological awareness and phonemic awareness and you said some of the resources that you use um, to teach in those areas are um, the word chain apps and um, the David Kilpatrick drills you then talked about um, alphabetic principle and your um, code based focus on spelling and um, you um, are an ideal user you use the ideal approach to so use the concepts probably from stage two to four but I'm thinking that your students are probably more in stage two and three mm. potentially um, and then you talked a lot about fluency and your your sort of newfound understanding that really fluency is made up of accuracy rate and phrasing it's complex mm. it's not mm. just about how fast we read in isolation. It's not just about it sounding like talking. It's mm. all of those three things coming together in unison and you're really sort of tracking that through your intervention. Um, you talked about vocabulary. You talked about how you're teaching that, but also through teaching meaningful word parts when you teach in morphology. And, you know, I think when I draw on my own personal experience at school, which is clearly going back a little while, um, I think, gosh, I would have understood what I was reading and comprehended the text a lot better if I had been taught about meaningful word parts, about what the root of the word means, what the prefix means, what the suffix means, and understanding how all of that um, comes together. So thank you for sharing that overview of what intervention looks like now. Can you tell I, us? So I probably should what say What difference too, the... has... I, I, I probably should just add there too. I forgot, like, you know, when you're doing um, your unreliable, you can build in your spelling rules there too. Light's just gone out here. Um, yeah, like, you know, change your word <laughs> of I because the word ends in Y and the con there's a consonant before, so change it to I. So you can, so it sort of moves it into that territory as well, which I think is an important point mm. as well. Yeah, because you mentioned about all of those elements of practice and explicit instruction. So we've got, you know, and you talked about the design of the lesson matters, the delivery mm. matters, and the content matters as well. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Thank you so much. I think that'll be really, really helpful for, for people who are listening. So how would you explain or how would you describe what the outcomes have been, you know, for your students and potentially the wider team of teachers mm. at Wakatipu High School? Well, yeah, well, as I said before, um, of it, the approach has been recognised by senior management as the, the, that's something that's working. So as such, it's been um, made a focus of that year evaluation plan. And a key focus is transferring that to other contexts, as I said before. The pre and post data um, fluency and spelling concept um, results for, from intervention groups over the last few years have shown improvements actually for all students. And I will say all students mm, to a degree. Right. And actually significant improvements um, for some of our students. And I would like to say that's over a relatively short period of time. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And I think the results also show, um, which goes me back to my quandary, that it is absolutely possible to make a difference 
um, even in a pandemic, I might say. The students are identified early um, with targeted <laughs> interventions, um, yeah, grounded in really sound and rigorous research. Um, I will, I, I need to say though that the attainment gap, and that's something I have to work on sometimes here, um, it, it's not going to be, it's, it's a long process, it won't close for, for, for my real, mm. um, my real mm. strugglers, but it is so possible um, to build their literacy skills, which are so necessary across the curriculum. So that's definitely an outcome. What I've noticed as an intervention teacher is the confidence that my kids have in attacking more difficult words as we go along in text. I've also noticed um, mm. uh, that students that were initially, um, and I think if you're listening from the secondary, you'll go, yes, how do we do this? That were reluctant to be in my class actually say to other staff members, often sometimes through disciplinary meetings, um, that this is the class that they're learning in most. And mm. um, I think the, one of the biggest problems in helping adolescent struggling readers is convincing them that they actually can learn to read. If you can talk, mm. you can speak, you can learn to read. And also, um, so, so basically seeing those self-defeating beliefs be reversed is, um, well, I don't, I, I mean, how do you talk about that as an outcome? So overall students experience success with reading and writing and enjoying being in a subject that they've previously had no success in. I want to point out though, and I think it's really important. Um, yeah, it isn't, there's no quick fix as the difficulties mm -hmm. that our struggling readers um, didn't suddenly, suddenly emerge at the entry to secondary school and improving the reading skills of um, older struggling readers is really difficult for a myriad of reasons and I want to be really honest about that. Um, I, um, a group of poor readers inevitably has a higher than average proportion of, of, of kids with um, interesting behaviours, other interesting behaviours you might say, which makes mm -hmm. engaging them just that little more difficult. They've come to us with a history of failure and frustration. They've often developed feelings of um, hopelessness and a lack of trust in their ability to succeed. And they've also developed really maladaptive habits, um, such as guessing and actually just avoiding reading altogether. And mm -hmm. that presents itself in behavioral problems, et cetera. So it takes me back to that original point. If we can get to our students earlier, um, that would be absolutely um, so incredibly life transforming for those yeah. individuals and for also us as a country and society as a whole. So I really want to put that out there. Outcomes for the team, we're a very yeah. small team, but we're a microcosm of learning support generally. I consider now the English department, dare I say it, the SLT team, they are part of my team and we are pretty much mm. in agreement with, we don't need to discuss any more how kids learn to read. We don't need to waste time. Mm, brilliant. We just need to get mm. on with it. So I think that's a pretty cool outcome. So um, yeah, lots of great outcomes. <laughs> that's awesome. And I, I really want to congratulate you and your leadership team on actioning the reality that learning to read doesn't end in the primary school when the primary schooling years end you know all too often um, as parents or teachers or educators we experience um, with all due respect a culture of the actual learning to read process ending at the end of primary mm -hmm. school um, and I think what you have talked about in this chit chat this afternoon Katie has been really really inspiring it's been incredibly motivating and I really hope empowering for people who are listening because I hope that first and foremost they 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 see and hear that we can do this in, in a secondary school setting we should be doing this in a secondary school setting and that it is our collective responsibility to teach literacy skills all the way to year 13 to ensure that, um, or whichever year that our students leave us, to ensure that we have all done the very, very best we can to add to the literacy ability levels of all of the students that, um, that we have the privilege of working alongside. So as we close off our chit chat this afternoon, what would be your sort of, you know, kind of number one go-to, um, you know advice piece of advice or number
number one tip for those um, people who are navigating their way through implementing support um, at a secondary school level or sitting out there and thinking, gosh, you know, how do we go about doing this? Or I'll try not to go on because I do have that capacity and keep it a little succinct here, but don't, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Anyone listening? I'm bad like that. Don't take shortcuts <laughs> with your professional learning. It's not a one day course kind of gig. Um, we, we, we took initially a journey of one year, but it continues. Mm. You need mm. your cell team to be prepared to invest in the training, the time to upskill um, key staff members. Don't give up. Um, adopting this approach requires quite significant paradigm shifts for some staff. Um, so you need your champions, your influencers to be there with you because you can feel like a bit of Lone Ranger battling it out there sometimes. There is great progress being made in New Zealand in reading and writing, mm -hmm. um, science of reading and structured literacy wise. But this is sort of big picture stuff and I'm not gonna tell anyone what to do, but I definitely feel so strongly that we all need to have a bit to, to lobby the government um, to basically to come to the party. The national str strategy has been released, um, which acknowledged the growing problem, but disappointingly so didn't acknowledge um, the huge body of research that's been mm. happening over the last four decades. Um, and, um, and we need the science of reading to shape that national literacy strategy. We can continue to do this in little silos, but we need some traction here. Um, in schools, primary and secondary, the resourcing required both terms of upskilling and putting the bodies who know what they're doing in front of these kids is big. Schools have been doing it off their own back. Mm. Um, once again, we need the government to get in there. We need, yeah, um, it has to happen. We can't waste any more time. It's, 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 um, people are going to run out of stamina, no matter how much energy they've got. Other thoughts... <laughs> um, Keeping older students engaged isn't easy. Um, I hear you talk about perky pace. I think that is absolutely huge at secondary school. Um, we've had, you know, when kids are away or they're taking, all kids take a long time to grasp concepts. That's why they're in, you know, they're in intervention. But when they're really struggling, I will actually get them out of class and, um, and I will get them up to speed because um, we, I lose all of them if we keep covering the same old ground when kids are ready to move on. Mm. Mm. Bring you, um, this is not sucky egg stuff, but bring you into your teaching. Um, if you're teaching the secondary sector and in intervention, these kids are coming in pretty low. I certainly bring my passion for yoga um, into, into my classes. Um, Travis Elliott, this great American yoga teacher, he um, injects a lot of quotes and stories into the yoga classes, and I share these with my kids. Repetition is a big part in yoga. It's also a huge mm. part to literacy. He uses Bruce Lee quote, quote, I fear not the man who does um, 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who does one kick 10,000 times. The kids love it. Just chuck it all in there. He talks about um, mm -hmm. the, 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 the five keys to level up your mindset, you know, embrace your challenges, be at peace with imperfection, enjoy the journey. Anything's possible if you can put your mind to it. And there's another one there too. Um, oh, what is it? Uh, oh, yes, it's coming in here. Focus on the effort and not the outcome. What's a mantra? Because these, I, mm. that's part of my review. Come on, guys, get get your mind in the right place. Yeah. We can do this. Um, lots of energy, lots of games, um, educational games, lots of those to go around. But the mahi done in intervention ultimately will be most successful when we have all teachers in all classrooms having an understanding, maybe not as deep, obviously, of the science of reading and putting evidence-based um, strategies in when kids are getting stuck on words, et cetera. So using your morphology, use, having understanding around how to help kids break those words and to build those word banks um, into those classes. And also, because I often hear teachers go, oh, these, there's so many kids that the spelling's terrible, but they're sort of putting it as, a, as an aside as opposed to Actually, that's so symptomatic of other things that are going to mm. impact on their reading and their comprehension. Mm. But I just want to finish. Go easy on yourself. It's it's big. Um, I think if you if if your intentions are great and you're moving in the right direction, because this is the right direction. Um, yeah, feel feel really confident in that. And I just want to say, I guess I want to finish is what is coming is greater than what is gone because I do feel like the momentum is growing. The snowball yes. effect is happening. Um, 
yeah, keep connected with each other. I have had a few emails, apologies if I haven't responded, busy educator, it gets a bit tricky, um, trying to keep all the wheels um, ticking over, but yeah, what, what is coming is bigger than what is, than what is gone. We are moving in the right direction. I'm um, sorry if you're, um, <laughs> and um, we just we just need to convince, um, I guess, the big big players, the big decision makers out there, um, that this matters. It counts, and it, and and it, and it does, and it will, and it will create the difference we're looking for in, in our mm. literacy learners who struggle. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie, for your time this afternoon. You have been an absolute inspiration I'm sure to so so many people who are listening and I feel so proud to have sat here this afternoon and listen knowing you know Gary the Cohen. mammoth <laughs> well I'm not so sure about that but it's a real privilege to work alongside teachers and leaders Katie when you and and I get to look back and see you know I know the journey you've been on and I know how much hard work it's taken how much dedication I also know that there's been an awful lot of work in um, building shared understandings, you know, and getting everybody onto the waka is not, a, it's no easy task. So I really want to um, commend you for that. And I want to thank you for your unrelenting passion and your willingness to share um, share what you have with us this afternoon so um it's always really great to catch up with you and um thank you to everybody who has joined us um for this live stream this afternoon and um also for those who are listening watching this as a recording um next month um our chit chat moves to reading fluency which might excite you a little bit and we actually do have the guru joining me who is jan hasbrook housebrook and um who is going to um help me um work with um explaining what reading fluency actually is and how we can work to build reading fluency in all of our readers so really looking forward to that next chit chat too so thanks for joining us everybody and we will look forward to seeing you um, next month <laughs>